Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to another in our series, The Best in Islam. In this segment, we'll be looking at the best in terms of clothing, what Allah had said with regards to the best, how we should look at clothing, how we should treat clothing, its importance, its value in our lives. And this series focuses generally on the best in all aspects of our lives. This is only one of the various avenues or one of the various, you know, aspects which perhaps sometimes we don't reflect on. So Allah has called us to reflect on it. He said in Surah Al-A'raf, that's the seventh chapter, verse 26, Ya Bani Adam, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسَ يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ O children of Adam, I have bestowed upon you clothing to cover your private parts and as an adornment, but the clothing of God consciousness is much better. So what is Allah speaking about here? He is informing us as children of Adam, and we're all descendants of Adam, that he gave us clothing in order to cover our private parts and also as adornment. These are the two main functions of clothing. The animals don't wear clothing. Monkeys, lions, elephants. It's not in their way of life. Well, we might put clothing on them. That's another story. But clothing is not from their nature. It is our nature to wear clothing. And Allah has bestowed it externally, that he has given us the means to create that clothing. And he created it internally, that we have a desire to have that clothing, to cover our private parts. So the main function of clothing is to cover our private parts, and then it is adornment. So there are elements of clothing which are for beauty purposes, to be attractive, etc. But primarily it is covering the private parts. This is an important point because, of course, when people look at the Muslim dress globally, they look at Muslim women, especially, as being oppressed in that they are forced to cover up what is classified as their beauty. They're required to cover up you know, everything except for face and hands. That is the norm of Islamic dress. So the main purpose of clothing, as Allah has stated, is to cover the private parts. That's the main purpose, secondarily, for adornment. So there's no harm in there being beautification which takes place with the clothing. Of course, where that beautification is expressed may vary if one is in a family circumstance amongst those who you can't marry, the maharim or women, then it's permissible for them to wear clothing which is more decorative, not necessarily covering as much as it would normally when they're outside the home. But the point is that it's a question of priorities here. Covering the private parts and you know, protecting the body from the elements you know, is primary. Secondary is that of adornment. Whereas when we look at the West, the West has shifted this. What is primary is adornment. Covering the private parts is not intended. In fact, Western dress is geared towards exposing the private parts. It is deliberately designed to expose the private parts. So this is a reminder for us, as Muslims, where should our clothing be? And this is not just something for women only, because there tends to be a double standard that women 
are required to maintain certain levels of dress, you know, protecting their bodies from exposure, etc. And of course, this greater stress there, because that's what's mentioned in the Quran, why it's mentioned in the Quran, and for the men, it's not really mentioned. The Prophet did give some guidelines in case of the men also, but in the Quran, it's actually mentioning about the women. Why? Because, you know, as Allah explained after instructing women to, you know, put over themselves their outer garments, etc., He explained that this was that they be known on one hand, ulayudain, and that they not be harmed. It is protecting them from harm because when a woman exposes herself, she exposes herself to physical harm in society. You know, this is reality. People might feel that the West promotes that men and women are equal, etc. So as a man can expose his body, you know, why should a woman be able to expose her body in the same way? But the reality is that the consequences of exposure, I mean, how many cases do we hear of women gang raping men? Don't think you're going to find any, you know. But the other way around, it's just increasing. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And when we look at women's clothing over the last hundred years, we see it evolving towards greater and greater exposure. So it's not surprising then that we find harm coming to women on a greater and greater and greater scale. It's not surprising. And this is happening not in the third world alone, it's happening in the third world too, but it's happening in the West, where freedoms are there and, you know, free access, male-female access, there are no restrictions, prostitution, you know, girlfriends, boyfriends, all these things are there. People have full access to sexual relations. Yet, rape, it is increasing, getting worse and worse. Why? When all of these doors have been opened up, is it worse now than it was 50 years ago or than it was 100 years ago? Because exposing the female brings for her harm. That's the bottom line. When Allah spoke about it 1,400 years ago, He spoke about a principle which is a universal principle. So when we look at Western dress, as I said, Western dress is geared towards exposing private parts. This is why a woman in New York, in the middle of winter, you know, it's freezing outside, she's wearing a miniskirt. You have to question, what, what's the purpose of this miniskirt here? You know, the miniskirt is exposing herself, exposing herself to the elements, exposing herself to the world. So there's a different philosophy behind that dress. As Muslims, we understand, as Allah said, the main purpose is to cover the private parts. Protect us from the elements, but cover the private parts. And the same thing with men, you know, what has become you know, popular in terms of Western men's clothing, which focuses on pants, for example, you know, the pants have evolved. You can see it evolving to a point where pants now, for men, expose private parts on a scale that it never did in the past. And this becomes an issue for us as Muslims when you have to deal with salah, because one of the conditions for the validity of prayer is that the private parts be covered, and especially in prayer as well as outside of prayer. So Allah points out this purpose in dress to enlighten humankind in terms of the proper values with regards to dress. But then he goes on to say, after all of that, the clothing of God consciousness is better that though one may cover oneself properly because of the pressures of society, etc. You know, some cultures, it would be unthinkable that a woman would expose herself. In those cultures, if there is no God consciousness, that outer dress, really relative to God, is of no value. It is still a requirement Islamically in order to maintain society in which sexual desires are brought down, it's not promoted and fired up 
through the media, etc., where women's dress and women's bodies are used to sell products. However, ultimately what the goal is, is that of consciousness of God. We should be conscious of God in all matters. And that consciousness acts like clothing, which protects us from evil. So that clothing, the clothing of God consciousness, is even more important. Allah goes on to say in Surah An-Nur, 24th chapter, verse 60, وَالْقَوَاعِدُ مِنَ النِّسَاءَ اللَّاتِي لَا يَرْجُونَ نِكَاحًا فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِنَّ جُنَاحٌ أَنْ يَضَعْنَ ثِيَابَهُنَّ غَيْرَ مُتَبَرِّجَاتٍ بِزِينَةٍ وَأَنْ يَسْتَعْفِفْنَ خَيْرٌ لَهُنَّ There is no sin for post-menopausal women who have no expectation for marriage to modestly discard their outer garment without displaying their adornment. But to refrain from doing so is better for them. So while we have the general commands of clothing, the purpose being to protect women from coming under attack from the male side, which is happening anyway, but clothing which doesn't cover them well, then invite further attack. So to protect them from harm. When a woman reaches a stage in life where there is no issue about marriage and desire and these kinds of things, she's in her late 80s, whatever, in these ages, Islam then allows a relaxation in terms of the dress. She does not have to wear the major outer garments, etc. But it doesn't mean that because this is the case, she would then expose herself. So Allah gives that okay without going to excess, to expose her charms, because still at whatever age, there still remains something that could attract and cause harm to her. So there is still some caution there. And that's why Allah goes on to say, but for them to refrain from doing so, even though it is permissible, that he's given the permission, to refrain from doing so is better. It's better. And Islam takes into account those different levels, where some people, we could say they're not as deeply committed, they would like that relaxation, Allah has given them room for that relaxation. But for those who want to stay strong in all aspects of the deen as they see it, then Islam says, better to go ahead with that. We're going to take a short break now before looking further at what the Quran has said with regards to clothing and what's best. In 2013, the International Open University started offering Udhiyya services globally for Eid al-Adha in different countries. We realized that there were those who wanted to get the reward of sacrificing for Eid, but either did not know where to go or the facilities to do the sacrifice were not available to them. For this reason, IOU has given these individuals the opportunity to have a sacrifice made on their behalf in needy Muslim countries, benefiting the Muslims there and truly sharing in the spirit of Eid. This includes countries like the Gambia, Ghana, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Somalia, and Uganda. Join us and be a part of the true essence of Eid, giving and gratitude. As it says in the Noble Quran, neither the flesh nor the blood of the sacrificed animal reaches Allah. It is your piety that reaches Him. Assalamu alaikum 
Welcome back from the break. And we spoke prior to the break on the general purposes of clothing, a gift from God. God gave human beings this blessing of clothing, having a consciousness for the need for clothing, distinguishing us from the animals who don't clothe themselves. He clarified for us that the main purpose of clothing is to cover the private parts. And secondly, it serves as an adornment. However, the clothing, the metaphorical clothing of God consciousness, which protects us from evil, is far more important. Allah goes on to say in Surah An-Nur, 24th chapter, verse 60, وَالْقَوَاعِدُ مِنَ النِّسَاءَ اللَّاتِي لَا يَرْجُونَ نِكَاحًا فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِنَّ جُنَاحٌ أَنْ يَضَعْنَ ثِيَابَهُنَّ غَيْرَ مُتَبَرِّجَاتٍ بِزِينَةٍ وَأَنْ يَسْتَعْفِفْنَ خَيْرٌ لَهُنَّ There is no sin for post-menopausal women who have no expectation for marriage to modestly discard their outer garments without displaying their adornment. But to refrain from doing so is better for them. So while we have the general commands of clothing, the purpose being to protect women from coming under attack from the male side, which is happening anyway, but clothing which doesn't cover them well then invites further attack, so to protect them from harm. When a woman reaches a stage in life where there is no issue about marriage and desire and these kinds of things, she's in her late 80s, whatever, in these ages, Islam then allows a relaxation in terms of the dress. She does not have to wear the major outer garments, etc. But it doesn't mean that because this is the case, she would then expose herself. So Allah gives that okay without going to excess, to expose her charms, because still at whatever age, there still remains something that could attract and cause harm to her. So there is still some caution there. And that's why Allah goes on to say, but for them to refrain from doing so, even though it is permissible, that he's given the permission, to refrain from doing so is better. It's better. And Islam takes into account those different levels, where some people, we could say they're not as deeply committed, they would like that relaxation, Allah has given them room for that relaxation. But for those who want to stay strong in all aspects of the deen as they see it, then Islam says, better to go ahead with that. Now, as we look at both of those verses concerning dress, we see that there are clear instructions here which are for the benefit of human society. And these instructions which guided Muslim civilization brought dress to much of the rest of the world. In many countries that Muslims came to, for example, India, one thing which oftentimes is not looked at, you know, society was a naked society. People didn't dress, didn't cover themselves. I mean, when you look at the carvings, paintings, etc., they're all depicted naked, or mostly naked. It was Islam that brought clothing. The idea of modesty, clothing of the body, this came from the influence of Muslims in many other parts of the world. When they came to Indonesia, similarly, etc., etc. 
Islam has brought guidance in this area that some people might say is, you know, what, what's the importance? Why not just leave it up to people to do what they wish and dress as they dress or whatever? Because Islam is a complete way of life. From God, it makes sense that there should be guidance in all aspects of life, at least important aspects. I mean, minor aspects may be left to us for our own judgment, etc. But otherwise, there is guidance for all of the most important areas of our life. And clothing is a part and parcel of it. So after that, after the general principles, becomes one of choice in terms of the colors that one wears in Islam and the designs as long as they fulfill the basic requirements. In terms of the color of cloth, we have a statement from the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, narrated by Anas, خَيْرُ ثِيَابِكُمْ الْبَيَاضِ أَلْبِسُوهَا أَحْيَاكُمْ وَكَفِّنُوهُ فِيهَا مَوْتَاكُمْ The best cloth is white in color. Clothe your living with it, and shroud your dead in it. This was the recommendation which the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, he gave. Why is white cloth best for the living? Because Islam stresses purity, cleanliness, etc. And the cloth which exposes when it gets dirty, the most is the white cloth. Darker cloth if it gets dirty, you're not conscious of it. You may not see it, may not realize it. Whereas when things have to be kept white, then they have to be kept clean. So there is that recommendation, there's that liking for white or light colored clothing so that we are maintaining more cleanliness in society, and we're encouraged to shroud our dead in it. But it's not an obligation. This is a choice. It's a recommendation on the part of Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. So the white color for general clothing is preferred. Technically speaking, it's whether male or female. However, outside of the home, for women, the wearing of black has become most popular, at least in the Arab world. When you go outside of the Arab world, then black is not necessarily the favored color. But at least underclothing, these type of things, clothing which it's important to know when it's getting dirty, then white is a preferable color. And this is just a prophetic recommendation. Shrouding the dead in it also is confirming that the cloth which is used is clean and we want those who we consign to the earth to be buried in at least a clean circumstance. So that is the prophetic recommendation. Combine that with the Quranic recommendation where Allah has reminded us of the gift which he gave us in terms of consciousness for the need for clothing, as well as the clothing, the methods and the means to create clothing, purposes of clothing, and of course, the spiritual clothing being even the most important. With that, we close our session, our session on clothes, what's better with regards to Allah and Islam. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless all of you. And we hope to see you in our next episode of The Best in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.